So what I'd like to be talking about today is linguistic diversity in a time of crisis. And I start by just taking you to one of um, our roads here. That's the M1 from Sydney North going. And this is a sign that I don't know whether you have them out there in Western Australia that much or not, but here they've certainly become an everyday occurrence. Um, stay COVID safe, unwell, get tested. So that's the sign for passing motorists. And it's become like completely normal, nothing unusual, really, you know, straightforward to process. But now think, um, think, take yourself back as a kind of time traveler to the beginning of the year. Imagine you'd come across this sign in January or February this year. Well, you couldn't have processed it because the word COVID did not even exist back then. The word COVID was announced by the World Health Organization as the term for the disease caused by the novel coronavirus on February 11, 2020. And um, it's probably the word in the history of all humanity and the history of all languages that has been learned in the fastest way by the largest number of people. I mean, it's used in pretty much all the languages of the world. It's pretty much known to, you know, more than close to 100% of the world's 8 billion people. And um, this kind of spread across languages and this kind of fast language learning must be unique. Um, you couldn't have processed other aspects of this um, at the time, you know, I mean, get tested on the road would have been like breathalyzing or something, but it certainly wouldn't have been um, around the symptoms. So what you, when you see a, a sign like this now, you know, this is about, um, it's not about being car sick and well, it's not about being car sick, for instance, it's about specific symptoms and, um, you know, like um, having a sore throat or lacking a loss of taste or running a fever. So these kinds of symptoms will um, trigger your reaction, so to speak. So what I'm trying to get at is we've all learned an enormous amount of new knowledge over the past couple of months. And this is both linguistic, but um, just, you know, so much new information about um, the disease, about how to protect ourselves, about how it's spreading, and so on and so forth. So it may well be the largest mass communication effort and the, ma the, the largest mass learning event that the world has ever seen. Now, how does global mass communication work? Assuming this is the greatest, so one of the greatest mass communication challenges in human history, well, we've actually got a global process for that. And the global process is that the, is a kind of top-down communication hierarchy that the World Health Organization collates all relevant new knowledge, brings it together, and then communicates it in members, to the member states. So the World Health Organization um, communicates in nine languages. Um, that's the um, six official languages of the United Nations. So that's Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. And then um, at some point in the pandemic, they also started to put out information in three additional languages beyond the official languages of the United Nations, and that's Portuguese, Hindi, and German. Now, um, these are nine languages. As you know, there are around five to 7,000 languages on the globe. So clearly that's just the um, the proverbial drop on the hot stone. So very few languages in relationship to um, the languages that are out there. 
However, you might think, oh, well, that's not such a huge problem because really the World Health Organization doesn't um, communicate to all the 8 billion people on this planet. They just communicate to the member states and that's um, just a bit under 200. Now, even there, of course, you see already a gap. However, um, I think it's fair enough to say, you know, the big languages will um, suffice to communicate with the member states. And then the member states are tasked to actually communicate this um, public health information to their populations and localize it to their populations. And there, of course, um, this problem that I've outlined of um, 200 states versus 600 languages persists. And um, very early in the pandemic, this emerged as a huge challenge. How do we actually communicate to everyone a disaster that affects everyone and where the actions of everyone have implications for the overall spread and for the overall well-being of the community of the community so let's look at um, how this has played out in Australia first a bit and then I'll talk some more about um, how this has played out in China so um, Australia is often seen as this you know Anglo Anglo-Celtic nation English-speaking nation but of course as you all know as we all know that's um, very far from the reality um, according to the most recent census, 2016, 22.2% of the Australian population, that's around 5 million, speak a language other than English at home. So we have um, close to a quarter of the population that, for, who, for whom English is not their main language. Now, most of these people are um, bilingual or multilingual, and they have English in their repertoire. But within the um, uh, load population, the population who speaks a language other than English at home, there are around 16%, and that's um, overall within the Australian population, close to 4% of the Australian population who don't speak English or don't speak it very well. And that's close to a million people. So um, that's clearly one group of concern when we are looking at mass communication that is important to really reach everyone that one group of concern is um, the one million people who don't speak English or don't speak it well it may well be that this increases um, quite a bit to all those for who are not so comfortable with English and so that's one segment. And then there is another segment of the population that we also need to consider here. And that partly overlaps with the non-English speaking population. And that's the people who have low levels of literacy. According to um, the OECD studies um, in the, um, the PIAC studies of um, a, a program of assessment of adult literacy, skill, literacy numeracy and digital skills, um, the figures that I'm showing you here are um, for the most recent Australian survey. And I want you to focus particularly on the first two groups here in the diagram, those that are listed as having below level one or level one literacy skills. Below level one and level one together, um, they are the kind of literacy levels that you expect of elementary school students. So what this means is that 13.7% of the Australian adult population, and so these are all adults, right? So adults as defined over 15 years old, actually only have literacy skills that you know, we expect of elementary school students. Now, most public health information ex um, is based on the assumption that you have higher literacy skills. So these, this is also a significant group, and that amounts to you know, 2.3 million people who um, we really need to think about very carefully when we think about a targeted mass communication strategy. Now, in terms of mass communication, 
um, you're probably familiar with these models of mass communication, but one thing that people often don't think about is um, how these different channels of mass communication um, enable, enable us to reach different people because they have different linguistic affordances or create different kinds of obstacles related to in which kind of language you actually communicate um, to your target population. And so um, the things that I've listed here are sort of the, the big channels. And of course, there's quite a bit of diversity, also quite a bit of overlap. I mean, TV nowadays is also available online. Uh, websites, you know, have their own ecology. They're seen as very, um, you know, very widespread, widely used radio has gone to the background. Um, so these all have different affordances depending on which language you speak and what I mean by that. And um, just, you know, billboards is sort of also flyers and that kind of thing. Loudspeakers is anything that's oral, um, but aimed at a very local community. And then there are all those door knocking efforts where you actually not necessarily knock at someone's house, but um, also sit down with an individual person or with a group of people and communicate orally in a small group. So we have all these kinds of channels and now we need to think about how these channels allow us to communicate different kinds of knowledge. Let me just give you two examples to kind of exemplify the affordances and obstacles that these various channels create. Um, very often linguists actually, oh, I've got the loudspeakers here. Um, very often linguists tend to think that it's a really good idea to um, um, communicate as multilingually as possible. But um, what this example tries to show you, and don't try to read it because it's impossible to read, and it's not impossible to read because I'm incompetent and couldn't get up, you know, a slide that um, is readable, but because this is actually a really kind of small piece of paper that's folded a number of times, it's from the European Union, and these are instructions how to use a hot water bottle in 11 languages. Languages. Now, and that's because in EU regulations, everything that you know is like an instruction how to use something has to be provided in um, various languages. Although not all these languages, as you can see, there's also Chinese here, are actually um, EU languages. But I'm showing you this because what I'm trying to say is that if you print. If you use the print medium for your mass communication and you use different languages or lots of different languages, you actually end up with other barriers. And the barrier here is obviously that this is so small that it's actually, um, for anyone who's not short-sighted, this is actually impossible to read. Um, but it's also off-putting in the sense that um, if I see too many languages, then I don't actually know what to focus on and what my language is. So um, I guess I wanted to just debunk the idea that lots of multilingualism is necessarily more inclusive communication. That's not the case. So you have to think about your languages and your language strategy in relation to your communication channel, in relation to um, your technology. Now, of course, websites are fantastic in actually allowing us to use different languages. And um, let's now look how that works. So um, what I've done here is I'm looking at the um, New South, so what happens in New South Wales if um, you experience any of the symptoms that they ask you about on the road signs so or if you experience any symptoms then you're supposed to go and get tested but most people will do and i say most because of course not everyone has internet access and not everyone has um, the kind of digital literacy to actually go and google and that comes back also to those literacy skills that i spoke about earlier but a vast majority of um, the Australian population will actually go and Google, where can I get tested? 
And so when you Google in New South Wales, where can I get tested for COVID, then you get to this website of the New South Wales government, which um, is actually written in quite simple language. So I ran one of those readability checks and gives you a flash reading ease um, that is targeted at a year six student. So that's for someone at level one, for instance, would be readable. And um, so that's great. It's close to basic English really. Um, that's very helpful. In addition, you may see that up in the, um, um, up in the top header, there is this bit language. And if you have enough English to actually understand the word language and read the word language, then you can click on that. And that brings you to a whole menu where you can actually look at different languages. There are 63 different languages. And um, as I said, if you have enough literacy in English, or proficiency in English that you actually know what the name of your language in English is and that you can actually read the Latin alphabet because they are all English language names, then you can actually click on, the, on that label and um, then find the relevant information in your language. Now, as I said, that's a really fantastic linguistic affordance, multilingual affordance of digital channels. However, the devil is here as everywhere in the detail because go on it and it turns out that this is actually a Google Translate. So I've clicked on um, the German for this and, um, you know, see how do I find um, a testing clinic in New South Wales in German. And um, it's barely comprehensible. And the problems are, I'll just give you a couple of problems. So um, for instance, there is vocabulary that doesn't exist in German. Um, this word that you've got here, Fallstandorte. I've looked it up in a couple of German dictionaries. It's just not there. Um, I Googled it and the whole World Wide Web has 97 instances of this word. And most of them in Australia for some mysterious reason. So it's like Australian German may have this word or maybe it's just the Google Translate word. Um, then there are these literal translations that don't mean anything in the target language. So an example that I've got here is it says um, in English you need to bring a form of identification and that's translated quite literally when it doesn't mean anything. I mean, there is a proper term for that in um, the German language. Then word order can be confusing to the extent that it actually changes the meaning. So the example that I've got here is um, about, um, you can receive your result securely. That's what it says in English. But the way um, this is translated into German, then it becomes actually, um, a, a kind of hedging, you surely can receive your result. So, um, um, securely train, uh, train changes to surely, and um, then you have these pragmatic inconsistencies where in German you have, um, as in French, you have this to and vu um, distinction, so different forms of address depending on um, the relative status of the speakers and their relationship or the kind of respect you want to express. So that's all over the place and you have both forms used um, quite haphazardly. And um, finally there are some inexplicable errors that I just have no explanation for whatsoever. In the example that I've got here, um, the sentence ends with a Z that I don't know where it comes from. Um, now, what you have to bear in mind, so this is, if you speak English, then you can understand this. And now what I want you to bear in mind is that the language pair German English is actually one of the best researched and most um, most well resourced language pairs that there are in the world. I mean, these are, um, you know, German is a major international language, major industrial nation. There is a significant research effort put into 
um, automated translation between these two languages. Even with these kinds of resources, you get this kind of result. Now, I've also done this um, for Persian, and I won't walk you through Persian, but what I can tell you is that Persian is complete gibberish. So the automated translation into Persian is incomprehensible. And um, I kind of would go so far as to say that having these kinds of multilingual versions there are almost worse than not having anything there. So um, on the one hand, of course, it's kind of inclusive and nice to see your language in a list, but that's really all. So it has the symbolic function, ah, my language is there, and that's kind of inclusive. But in terms of practical, um, information in terms of actually providing you a linguistic resource, providing information. If you need the information only in that language, if you don't read English, it's worse than nothing because as I said, it can be gibberish. It's really hard to understand. So in that case, um, we go back to English. And as I said, it's relatively basic. So it's actually not too difficult. However, having said that, that doesn't mean that everyone can actually, um, the fact that, you know, the readability score for this kind of text is relatively low and relatively easy doesn't, doesn't mean that we don't have communication barriers. And to understand what communication barriers there are, we really need to kind of um, do ethnographic research and gain an understanding of how people interact with a website like that. And um, I've got one, um, one example here. I don't expect you to read all this. Um, it's from a comment on language on the move. And um, I'll just explain it to you. So this is um, an ESL teacher who actually got one of their students who needed to be an ESL student here in Sydney who needed to be tested. And so they helped them with the website. And um, one thing that they discovered was that it's actually not necessarily only language, but that things like the postcode may create barriers. And so what this teacher speaks about is that very often um, second language learners you know, need to figure out how addresses work in another language. And um, it's easy to confuse your street number with your postcode. And so um, in order to actually be able and identify where the closest test clinic is, what this person needs is not only simple English, not only plain English, but they actually need someone to talk them through. And that can be in English if it's someone who understands their language needs. So um, we come back again to this question of how can we ensure at a local level that everyone gets the information they need and how can we actually um, use the various types of technologies in ways that are most inclusive. Um, so this has obviously been a problem like from day one of the pandemic and on Language on the Move we started documenting these kinds of local challenges, these kinds of um, you know, in an effort to foster ethnographic research, in a in a foster to in an effort to foster localized understanding and just also an understanding of all the various challenges that are out there, we started documenting um, language-related challenges of the pandemic already back in February with um, the first research blog post we did was on minority com or. COVID-related public health communication in um, Southwest China. And since then, we've had 28 um, research blog posts from um, 12 different countries from all continents where various people analyze language-related challenges in their context. And um, if you haven't had a chance, please do head over to Language on the Move under the tag COVID-19 to our COVID archives, because you'll find um, that 
there just is really an incredible diversity, but also an incredible documentation source that we've recreated, that we've created. And so we've got um, research there from South Africa, from Cameroon, from Mexico, um, from Morocco, as you can see here, Denmark, China, um, Australia, of course. So. Um, that was one effort. Now, very early when we, as I said, we started doing this and bringing these ver um, various reports together from February onwards, very soon it became clear to us that we also wanted to make more of an academic research contribution. And together with two of my colleagues from um, Shongnan University in Wuhan and um, so the first epicenter of the pandemic and um, Li Jia from Jinan University in Kunming also in China. We put together a call for papers in March where we um, Ask people, you know, we'd like to put a, we'd like to put together a special issue of multilingual devoted to um, sociolinguistic perspectives on the pandemic and questions related to what are the language challenges in context of linguistic diversity that people face. Now, um, I think this must be one of the most widely read calls for papers in the history of sociolinguistics because over 12,000 people actually read that call for papers. Uh, and um, within our deadline, which was like two or three weeks, we received more than 200 abstracts, again from around the world, which um, on the one hand was very gratifying, of course, that it's clearly struck a chord, but on the other hand, it was also just, a, it, it was mind boggling in the sense that we didn't know what to do with 200 abstracts. I mean, in a special issue, we had, um, we had been working on the assumption that, you know, there would be less than 10 papers and um, we'd maybe get, I don't know, 20 or 30 abstracts and we'd be able to comfortably choose. Now, um, we got so many fantastic abstracts, as I said, over 200. So um, that was a real logistical challenge to actually um, select those. What we ended up doing was um, we put all papers that dealt with anything outside the Chinese world to one side. And um, although we hadn't intended it, we ended up focusing on language challenges in the Chinese world. Because at that time, um, so that was in early April then when um, we made our decisions, it still seemed like there was a course to the pandemic. And it's well, China is two, three months ahead of the rest of the world. They are already at a point where they seem to be getting it under control. And, you know, so we sort of felt probably the rest of the world is following a similar pattern and they just two, three months behind. Now, of course, today that has turned out to be completely wrong. Um, China has got the pandemic under control, but as you know, um, they are, um, that's, you know, far from the case in most other places in the world. So um, we brought together the selection of research from um, the Chinese world and um, after, you know, all the authors working very, very hard to get something together in the very short time they had and all the reviewers doing a fantastic job and reviewing all our papers in record speed and um, everyone revising their papers in record speed and our production team working at record speed. We actually put out a special issue already. So um, I'm kind of really proud because I think it's probably the first concerted sociolinguistic research effort that deals with the language, language challenges of the pandemic. And so that came out as Multilingual issue 39, um, issue 5 in September, about a month ago. And at the bottom of the screen, you can actually see the URL for the special issue. Now, the special issue um, is 
completely free access. Um, that's thanks to the publisher, De Greuter Mouton, who has um, made, made it available, made all the papers available, open access. So just head over to um, that URL or Google Multilingua and then find the special issue and download the papers and read them to your heart's content and um, make them available to your students and colleagues. So let me just talk about the key topics that we then covered in the special issue. And um, one kind of area we focused on are language barriers affecting the global supply chain. And that's related to the fact that, as I said, um, one of our editors, um, Jenny Shang, comes from Wuhan and Wuhan, as it so happens, is actually, um, as you probably know, is actually one of the centers of the production for personalized protective equipment in the world. And now when Wuhan went offline and actually became the epicenter of the pen or the first epicenter of the pandemic, they not only stopped producing personal protective equipment, including masks, but they actually needed to import masks. And so that proved to be a major um, logistics challenge, particularly as um, the, the kind of assumption was and the way many of these global supply chains work is actually they work with English as the overlay language. However, um, when Wuhan went offline in terms of uh, mask production, the um, centers that came online were particularly in Southeast Asia. So Myanmar started to ramp up their production, Thailand, Vietnam, Bangladesh. And so these were the key countries that came on stream, except um, the way these global supply chains work it was actually really difficult source from new providers, new producers through um, any medium other than their local languages. And so that provided a major challenge simply because most of the people who work in supply chains as like administrators and whatnot, they operate in China, they operate through the medium of Chinese and English. They don't actually operate through the medium of Thai, Burmese, uh, Vietnamese or um, Bengali. So how that challenge was, well, that it A, was identified as a challenge and then how it was met is um, a key topic in the special issue. Another key topic relates to the communication experiences of minority populations and indigenous minorities. I think where we are now at, at that stage, we are now at in the pandemic, we've become quite aware of the language barriers facing um, both migrant and indigenous minorities but that has really evolved over time and just the fact that we are more aware doesn't necessarily mean we are doing it a whole lot of better certainly um, minorities everywhere have been excluded from timely high quality information and that has created a major gap and has also made them much more vulnerable to fake news and, and disinformation. So that's been a huge problem and so a number of the research brought together in the special issue looks specifically at that. And um, finally another key topic is, is anyone saying anything or does anyone want to ask a question? Am I talking too fast? No. Okay. Um, so another key topic is around the demand for language services and language workers, and particularly in underserved languages. So um, the fact that you realize that you actually need a multilingual communication strategy and the fact that you realize that um, certain minorities are being underserved does not necessarily mean that you actually can go and um, provide them with timely high quality information if you haven't actually invested 
prior to an emergency in those kinds of languages in capacity to have the right people who can translate and interpret who can communicate um, health information and so on and so forth so um, these things don't just come on stream and so there's a huge demand for language services and language workers which um, we haven't been able to meet really to meet really globally um, so key challenges related to all that is um, a the dominance of English centric global communication. I've already given you this example with the supply chains that the assumption in China certainly was that within China we communicate in Chinese and if we need to communicate internationally then we communicate in English. Um, however, the pandemic really showed something and that was or was a catalyst a, cat a catalyst for the realization that that is not enough um, that actually english doesn't work for lots and lots of minorities and i think the same we're now seeing from europe for instance research from europe now showing that actually again the assumption is that if you need to communicate with someone who doesn't speak a national language anywhere in continental europe then you do that in english except the the main source countries of migrants and indigenous minorities in those but they don't speak english either so english really is not the problem of the solution to problems of global communication. Um, another key challenge is, of course, the long standing devaluation of minority language. And as I've just said, this is not something that you can solve overnight. If you realize that you are having um, a weakness in your communication strategy, that you're just using one language that you need to use other languages that doesn't mean you magically have the ability to solve that problem you only have the ability to solve that problem if there actually is long-standing investment in those minority languages and what we've actually done over the past um, decades is devalue minority languages and so instead of building capacity we've actually reduced capacity in that area and again i think that's true internationally and um, I think the other thing um, that emerges as a key challenge is that language is not only about information. So I've now talked a lot about how important it is to have a targeted communication strategy in the language that people speak that allows minoritized populations timely and high quality access to information. However, in addition, there is, of course, also, as we all know, as linguists, there is this other function of language that connects us with people. And um, one thing that has also become very, very obvious through the course of the pandemic is, of course, um, the fact that this is not only a physical health crisis, but it's also a mental health crisis. And the lockdowns and, um, and, and the, the economic meltdown have, of course, for many people been extremely distressing. And um, so it's clear that one thing that is needed is really just also increased uh, mental comfort, it's uh, mental health care services, it's connections, it's social trust. and. Um, I think we need to think much more carefully about um, what kind of trusts and what kind of relationships are enabled by particular language choices. So it's not only about this objective, like language provides us with information, which is very, very important, um, but there is an additional really important challenge that we need to recognize much more. Um, in the special issue, we also talk about what, what the implications of the pandemic and the implications of the findings of the authors are for the way we do sociolinguistics. And um, again, I think these things are not necessarily new, but um, the pandemic really has become a catalyst for showing us that these implications and, and that we need to do sociolinguistics in a different way and um, in particular all the authors and editors of the special issue we agree that um, sociolinguistic epistemologies need to include local knowledges and grassroots practices and I think too often we treat those local 
knowledges and grassroots practices as kind of an object of our investigation, but we do not actually make them part of our epistemologies and um, of our research. And that relates to the fact that we just really need to diverse the knowledge base, including um, the, the, the linguistic profiles of the academics who produce that knowledge base. And um, that relates to um, the English dominance of the field that um, I've been talking about for a long time. And finally, um, we felt that another really important implication was that sociolinguistics needs to re-enter dialogue with policymakers and activists. Um, that's something that sort of was really big in language policy in the 1960s and 1970s and maybe into the 80s, but then we all of a sudden all felt that this was too positivist and you know we needed greater theoretical sophistication and that's all true at the same time by pursuing ever more um, ever greater theoretical sophistication and ever greater conceptual detail i think we've actually often lost um the kind of applied side of things and so we really need to recapture that dialogue with um with policymakers and activists um one contribution to the special issue who puts forward a policy framework and kind of a framework for how do we actually deal with these challenges going forward is um, Li Yuming and his co-authors. He's from Beijing Language and Cultures University and um, he proposes an emergency linguistics and he proposes um, the NELC that you see here stands for National Emergency Language Competence. And um, his proposal is that we need to think about emergency language competence along four dimensions. And um, these dimensions are, first of all, the stage. At which stage of an emergency are we before? Because you need to be prepared for a disaster during um, the disaster and, of course, afterwards. And another dimension would be related to linguistic tasks, so information provision, what I've spoken about in quite some detail, but also this kind of comfort provision, um, the relationship building and the trust building, and of course related to monitoring, like what kind of information is out there in what languages. And again, that's something that's only just becoming apparent to us as we now find ourselves engulfed not only in the pandemic, but also in an epidemic, in a pandemic of misinformation. And something that I just should add that the World Health Organization warned of or warned us about very early that there would be an infodemic, they call it, and, and the infodemic might be just as dangerous as the pandemic. And that has, of course, turned out to be the case that now we are at a point where many people just find it hard to believe anything. And um, a third dimension would be around what type of language, so um, the standard national language, the non-standard national languages, and that comes very much out of the Chinese situation where you have Mandarin as the standard language and then all those kinds of non-mutually non intelligible non-standard languages, then the minority languages, major international languages, such as English, of course, and then cross-border languages. I think that's, um, again, something we need to focus on much more, maybe less so in Australia, but um, certainly in, in landlocked countries and um, sign languages and Braille. And the fourth capacity, uh, the fourth dimension he talks about relates to capacity building, capacity in terms of language management, in terms of mobilizing language volunteers and, and language talent, in terms of the kind of intellectual talents. I mean, who speaks what language and who can communicate through which channel, in which language, about which topics. We also need just really good data about um, who speaks which languages. And I think there we are in a really good position in Australia that we actually have the census data every five years about the um, home languages and the makeup of the uh, the linguistic makeup of the Australian population that's something that many other countries don't have 
and finally also technological capacity because certainly one way to deliver multilingual messages um, is through digital de technologies. Um, I think I'll just stop here. I was going to talk also about how did we actually pull off the special issues so quickly and, and think about a bit about knowledge production in a time of crisis. But I think I can actually do that if that's of interest to you um, in the Q&A session. And it just would be more interesting maybe now to actually move on to your questions and to your feedback. If you found this interesting, um, there are two more events related to the special issue of multilingual where actually all the authors will talk about their research and that's in two th symposia on Thursday November 5th and November 7th and um, one in Chinese and one in English because we're very committed to multilingual knowledge production and um, so if that's of interest to you save the dates and the actual zoom links will be up on language on the move in the not too distant future and with that thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your comments and questions <laughs>